of History and Culture in Washington, D.C., and it was accepted. In fact, I received a personal email from the museum's executive director, Mr. Lonnie Bunch, informing me that curators of both music and photography would contact me to begin the submission process. Now the work of Steve Jackson Jr. is on exhibit in both of those wings of the museum. My father would be so proud, and I know that wherever he is, he is satisfied that his work was left in good hands and it will not be forgotten. I may have been a middle child, but I've always been the go-to kid, yes. And so now on with the show, San Francisco in black and white. I'd like to give you all a minute to just read this slide about the exodus of African-Americans and the Great Migration. I'll give you a minute, but it's critical to this presentation because these people just didn't decide to go on a lark and go to New York or come to California. They were moving just like refugees from any other nation looking for acceptance and wanting to make a better way for themselves. This presentation is dedicated to my parents, my uncles and aunts, and all of the courageous African-American pioneers who took a giant leap in order to create a better world for themselves and their progeny. I have benefited greatly from your bravery and sacrifices, and it is with boundless gratitude and admiration that I honor and salute you. The great migration was an American phenomenon, and we had a lot of great African American writers who documented this migration of people. And this is a piece of poetry by Langston Hughes, written in 1924, entitled Youth. We have tomorrow bright before us like a flame, yesterday a night gone thing, a sundown name, and dawn today broad arc above the road we came, we march. And that's what these people did. I wanted to give you an idea of the migration and uh, the number of African-American people that migrated to San Francisco. And as you can see in the third column, I have which war was in effect when the migrations were happening because wars stimulate economies and there were defense jobs and other ancillary jobs. And so we had San Francisco, uh, African Americans coming to San Francisco in droves with our highest number in the population being in the 1970s at 96,000 people. Oh, incidentally, I didn't make a note of it here, something I forgot, but these stats are from the United States Census Bureau. And now I want to tell you about my family and how we got here. This is my grandfather and five of his brothers. My grandfather is the gentleman right here in the pinstripe suit, ain't he fine? And standing behind him is my uncle Leroy. My grandfather was one of nine boys and seven girls. That's Uncle Leroy behind him. Uncle Leroy left Louisiana in 1932 and moved to Los Angeles. It was him who invited my father to come out to Los Angeles after the war. The woman on the right, this is Uncle Leroy's wife, Aunt Bernice, and that, those are her two younger sisters. My uncle and aunt hosted throngs of family members and friends from down south who wanted to make a new start because that's the way it was done. You come and establish yourself and then you help others come and make that journey too. And they did that for so many people. Uh, Uncle Leroy retired after 30 years working at BF Goodrich, but he helped so many friends and relatives get jobs along the way. And he also um, owned a cafe on Central Avenue during that period, that era's heyday. This is my grandmother and her daughters and her daughters-in-law. Her name was Della Jackson. And that's my mother right here standing right next to her. Um, my grandparents had 11 children, 37 grandchildren, 
And I can't even begin to count how many great grandchildren they have. I have so many little cousins I will never know, but they're Jacksons and they are loved just the same. These are my mother's parents. They are Frank and Mary. Um, this was taken in about in the 1940s. They had eight girls, no boys, and 15 grandchildren. These are their sons-in-law. And that's my father right here on the end. He probably set this up and let someone else take this photograph. And this is my little cousin, Deborah, flashing everybody. She's really quite a dignified woman now. This is one of my father's first bottles. This is my mother. And I suspect this was taken in 1947. She grew up in a little town called Industry, Texas where cotton was still king in the 1920s and 30s. The only thing that, this is her again, isn't she beautiful? Look at that hair. But the only thing that I really have to tell you that was interesting about the place that she grew up was that Bonnie and Clyde hid out there when my mother was a little girl. So that was the most exciting thing that ever happened in Industry, Texas that I can talk about. I like to call this photograph getting the hell out of Texas because when I, <laughs> my grandfather and my father's siblings always told me that my father as a little kid used to tell them, when I get grown, I'm getting out of here and y'all ain't never going to see me again. Well, he did get the hell out of Texas, but we did go back for many, many summer vacations. But he was a man that had ambition and he always wanted more than what the Jim Crow South was allowing him. And so he made a decision that he and my mother would not even have children until they found a place where they could do that and the opportunities would be, would be better for them and for us. Um, my father went to Los Angeles first because Uncle Leroy invited him there and he was liking it okay, but he saw a lot of LAPD harassment against African Americans and Latinos. And so he knew he wasn't going to stay there. Now, this pretty lady, that's my father's half sister, my Aunt Willie. She and my other Aunt Ruby had come out to San Francisco during the war and they had been working. And so before my father left Los Angeles, they invited him to come up to San Francisco to see if he might like it. And he said, as soon as he got off of the bus, he knew that he was going to stay. You know, my father grew up in the, in the Sun Belt where it's hot all the time. And he said, the thing that I remember most that he said about first arriving in San Francisco, that the breeze was so cool and his shirt wasn't sticking to him. And then he saw the water and he knew that that was the place that he wanted to be. My Aunt Willie also was an entrepreneur at, in, in addition to working. She ultimately opened her own dry cleaners called Dixie Cleaners, which was at the corner of Turk and Scott in the Fillmore most of my childhood. Uh, let's see. Uh-oh. Oh, I got to go. Let's see. I think I might have missed one. Yeah. No. Okay, well, there you go. This is Auntie again, with, and this is her husband, W.A., my uncle. He actually named me. He was a Native American from Oklahoma, and they stayed married until his death of cancer in the 1980s. Now, this is my cousin, Simi. She also is from Texas, but she lived here for many years in San Francisco. And when I was growing up, she had a dress store and she sold dresses and fabrics. And I used to work with her on the weekends and, you know, make a little money. And so she also offered me an opportunity. But you can see that I come from a family of entrepreneurs. Now, I want to talk about the new Negro, because when we refer to the Harlem Renaissance, that is very specific about Harlem. But what I want you to understand is that there was a Renaissance amongst African Americans that was catching fire all around the country. And one of the great Harlem Renaissance writers, Elaine Locke, documented that attrition 
for the younger generation is vibrant with a new psychology. The new spirit is awake in the masses, transforming what has been a perennial problem into the progressive phases of contemporary Negro life. He is talking about the progress of the new Negroes. No longer agrarian, picking cotton, doing domestic work. Well, some did do domestic work, but in San Francisco, it was no cotton to pick. So that was done. Now, black is beautiful. Imagine being in a place where you're told that you're ugly, you are not wanted, that you have no value, but you strike out and you find a new place. Bam, they knew that they were beautiful and they worked very hard and they started to enjoy life in ways that they had never done down south. The new Negroes who came out west were strong, hardworking people. In an effort to establish themselves, they replicated the communities they came from, forming churches, religious organizations, small businesses, social clubs, and political organizations. These people had firsthand experience with oppressive working conditions, and they became strong union people because unions were the working class's greatest advocate for fairness in labor. One of the earliest lessons my parents taught me was to never cross a picket line because I was taking bread out of someone's mouth and I never have. It's one of the best lessons I've ever learned. Aren't they beautiful? Relaxing, enjoying their lives, working very hard and having great times on the weekends. These are everyday people out on the town and I just always thought that these women were so beautiful and the men looked so sharp and dapper. These are some clearly young women, probably working young women, maybe a couple of moms, enjoying themselves at those Bob City, one of the hottest clubs in San Francisco at the time. A lot of the great jazz greats came through there. And later on in this presentation, I'll be able to share some of those other photographs with you. But this is about the people today, not about the jazz greats. Isn't she beautiful? I put this one as a circuit around 1951 because I'm looking at this gentleman here in his military uniform, and this was taken clearly after World War II, so it had to be Korean War, which was from 1950 to 1953. Again, this one was taken at Jimbo's Bob City. I've always liked this picture because I never knew what was happening behind this woman's face. I mean, she's got something going on, but she's not revealing it to anyone. So when you look at this face, all you get is a good question mark, but she is beautiful. Debutantes. I'm telling you, these people came out west and went to the east coast and they duplicated everything that they had been denied in other parts of the country. So this is a woman's club in the 1960s. And I don't need to have a color photograph to know that all of these women were wearing white dresses. If you can see, they all have on white court, white shoes. White is really big and black. So um, I don't know what this could have been, but they look gorgeous, don't they? This, well, these are four members of the Crosstown Sportsman's Club. This is my father right here. This is Mr. Gilmore. I don't remember this gentleman's name. And this is Mr. Anderson. These, were, these people were fixtures in my childhood. We did a lot of things together. The Crosstown Sportsman was a social club that they put together. And we did a lot of wonderful things we went on. They had weekend bus trips to Reno and camping trips and fishing trips and their official blazers you can't tell it because these are black and white but they were mustard color they looked like they were a bunch of century 21 real estate agents but we used to have a really good time again another organization people really wanted to document that they were there and that they had done something now 
these are some travelers and I can tell this is at the Southern Pacific uh, Railway Station and this is Louis Jordan, one of the biggest stars of his era. He was like the, um, who can I say, the John Legend or someone of his era. And this was taken in the 1950s. See, do you remember when people used to dress up? I mean, you have to be old to remember when people dressed up to get on a plane or a train, but we really used to do it. And this is a family, even, I think they're about to board a United flight out at SFO, and this is probably taken in the 1960s. This is a very uh, special picture to me because it's the men of St. John's Missionary Baptist Church. This is a church that my mother belonged to for more than 30 years. And this is Reverend Morgan right here. She has the utmost respect for him. They don't make ministers like that anymore. Now we got mega churches and flashy guys. Now, I don't know who these gentlemen are, but I've looked at this photograph for years and never um, couldn't place it. But I do believe it may have been down south where they might have had um, an incorporated area that was uh, strictly African-American because there were many communities like that throughout the south, um, apparently um, beginning immediately after the Civil War. As a matter of fact, my grandfather in Houston, Texas, lived in one of the oldest African-American neighborhoods in Houston called Pleasantville. And Pleasantville has a history of ex-slaves settling there, and a lot of their same families still live in that community today. Now, this is, on, this is in San Francisco over in the Fillmore. Now, I don't know if this is a religious group. I think it is because I can see the banners, but I've never really had a good understanding of it. But it does speak to the organization that these people had and, and doing whatever they, you know, it was that they needed to do. These are the Masons and the Eastern Stars. This is another secret society of religious organization. My father was a Mason and my mother was an Eastern Star. And I don't know any of those secrets because they were not telling them. These were things that they took to the grave. Some more Masons. Lots of church people. You know, those of you that are watching, if you're from San Francisco, you may see someone that you know or something that you remember. I'd love to hear from you. I'll give you that information a little bit later at the end of this uh, presentation. Dig those crazy afros. Look at that. It's definitely it's probably in the late 60s or the 70s. But this is, a, this is a clearly a youth choir, children singing in the choir, young people rather. Now, I know that this was taken over in the Ingleside neighborhood here in San Francisco, probably on Lee Street, because this lady lived next door or a few doors away from my Aunt Ruby, and she was very proud of her garden, as you can see. I don't know what they about, but they look like they about it, don't they? Again, another children's group. And I don't know what this is, but the girls wear crowns. I could get with that. Okay, and then we had a Black Golfers Association, and there was a chapter here in San Francisco and another in Oakland. And I have a lot of other photographs of them, but I only put this one in because I'm trying to, you know, just show you the, the uh, diversity of organizations and the interest of the people. This is 7th Avenue Missionary Baptist Church. This is Mr. McCoy, Mr. Alan McCoy, and this is his wife, Esther. They were very dear friends with my parents. Mr. McCoy was also a member of the Crosstown Sportsman's Club, and uh, his wife and my mother and some of the other uh, women in the club were good friends before the club and after the club uh, disbanded. This is Ollie Blair. She was a fixture in San Francisco. She was another woman who came from the South, got a great government job, and worked her whole life until she retired. Um, she was also a longtime member of St. John's, and she was a very, very dear friend to my parents. You know, it's amazing how many of these people knew each other when they were back in Texas or in other parts of the South, specifically for my family in Texas and Louisiana, but they kept their ties. They kept 
make their connections. One of my mother's dearest friend, who is deceased now, lived over on Fulton Street for years, and it is she, her name was Clara Lacey. Um, she was the one who introduced my parents to each other, and her uncle, who was a minister, is the one who performed my parents' wedding ceremony back in 1948. And these people knew each other um, in Texas and in San Francisco until they, you know, went on to glory. I don't know who they are, but aren't they cute? They look like they could break out and dance like Michael Jackson, don't they? Very handsome twins. I should know this lady, but I'm sorry to say that I don't. Maybe someone out there could help me with her name. But isn't she beautiful? I mean, people believed in being very stylish back then. You didn't see casual clothes as much as you see now. As a matter of fact, all we really see are casual clothes. But these people really knew how to dress. And she's got on, her, the gloves are shiny. You can tell that they're leather. Look at her. I can't tell if she's mad or happy, but she's conveying something. I just don't know what it is. Aren't they beautiful in their polka dot dresses? Love and marriage. You know, my father wasn't just a jazz photographer or a family photographer. He did weddings. He did funerals. He did all sorts of things. And these are some of the um, wedding photographs that he did over the years. It's about 1950s. I guess he looks happy, huh? These are our family friends. This gentleman here is Mr. Sonny Sisk, and this was his beautiful bride, whose name also happened to be Linda. And I haven't seen them in many, many years, but I hope they're doing well and still married. Here's another bride. My father knew people all over the city, and he was always invited to cover some event uh, or another. Entrepreneurs, movers, shakers, and men about town. This is Uncle Tiny. Uncle Tiny was a big man about town in the 1950s and 60s here in San Francisco. He was a radio DJ and an MC, and he was a singer. He did some of everything. But Uncle Tiny, of all the people that my father um, was around when I was growing up, Uncle Tiny was one of his friends. He came to our house, and we went to his house. This is Uncle Tiny with Mel Torme, and I don't understand. I don't know who this other gentleman is. But you can see... Uncle Tiny was there with everything, and ironically, they called him Uncle Tiny because he was such a big man. But I have to tell you, when we used to go to Uncle Tiny's house when I was growing up, everything was big. It was like stepping inside of Alice in Wonderland or something. Because he was a big man, he had big furniture, big easy chairs. Everything was so largely oversized. And, it, it, and no matter what time we visited Uncle, uh, uh, Uncle Tiny, he was always dressed, you know, to perfection, which was really interesting. You know, there was a time in this country when people used to drop in on each other and pay a visit without calling. And you were welcomed in. They always had some cake or something for you. And so I grew up in that era. And we would go to Uncle Tiny's house. And with all the big things that Uncle Tiny had, he had on top of his big television, a wooden, a hand-carved redwood holder. And it was about, I want you to see my hands. It, it, it was cupped like this. And it was about this big and long. And what it held was not a scimitar. It held a giant candy cane that was about this big and round and very, very long. And so after a few pleasantries with the adults, He'd look around at us kids and he'd say, hey, y'all want some candy? And of course, we said yes. 
So Uncle Tiny would pull out his pocket knife. You know, this was an era when a lot of men wore pocket, carried a pocket knife, you know, it was, or a Swiss army knife. So Uncle Leroy, excuse me, Uncle Tiny would take out his his knife and break off large shards of this huge peppermint candy and he would give it to us in our bare sticky hands and I can still just see the look on my mother's face as she would just cringe because she didn't she was so genteel and so southern and she kept us so clean and immaculate she just couldn't stand that we were about to have sticky hands and no place to put these big pieces of peppermint candy maybe that's why I love peppermint candy to this day because of Uncle Tom you know, in the research for this project, I was trying to identify through clues in some of the images who some of these people might be. And I knew the name of Orville Luster. And so having lived outside of San Francisco for a very long time, I just wanted to uh, research him. And I, then it all just came back to me. Orville Luster was a social worker and a human rights commissioner here in San Francisco. But most importantly, well, I guess to me, he was the executive director of San Francisco Youth for Service. Mr. Orville Lester, this is him right here, used to go into uh, Bayview Hunters Point, Patrol Hill, the Tenderloin, the Mission District, and work with gang members. And he'd get them, he'd actually show them a way that they could actually change their lives and be productive members of society. He And many of them went on to become bankers and lawyers and, and professional people because Mr. Or Orville Lester stepped in to uh, help them and rescue them. Now, during the era of redevelopment in San Francisco, there, uh, Mr. Orville Lester um, got together with James Baldwin to see, because there were a lot of fights about redevelopment. People were always trying to stem the tide, but it was just really too late. But there was a documentary done in 1964 called Take This Hammer. And, um, you can find it on YouTube, and it's really, really compelling. You know, I love James Baldwin so much. As you can see, he's my buddy in back of me right there. But he really cared a lot, and his work is having a new resurgence because many of the things that he predicted in the 1960s have come to pass in the 21st century. This is Mr. Elmo Allison. He used to be an auto salesman at Neville Ford. He sold Fords. And it was when I was doing this, this uh, putting this together, I thought about it. That's why all of my family members drove Fords. I grew up in brand new Fords that my father bought from Mr. Allison. My uncle, my uncle Debye and Willie's husband who named me, he bought his first um, Thunderbird from Mr. Allison in 1955. Mr. Allison was a popular man, kind of a raconteur himself. Uh, I think he did a little emceeing, but wherever he went, they always gave him a microphone and the opportunity to advertise himself so that he could sell more cars. Aren't these beautiful Thunderbirds? You can see the street sign. I don't know if you can see it very well, but that's at the corner of Vale and San Bruno. I couldn't find much about Neville Motors online, but I did find this. This is a vintage license frame from that company on sale, $99 on eBay. I think I'd rather buy a bus pass. This is Mr. George R. Riley. This is the, the, this white gentleman here. He ran for mayor of San Francisco twice, once in 1943 and once in 1955. He served, I think he is known to be 
one of the longest serving elected members of any elected office. He served for 44 years on the California State Board of Equalization. Now that's an office that sets up tax assessments and that sort of thing. And so it's no wonder that he would take on that in his profession because Mr. George R. Riley, by profession was a real estate broker. So he knew exactly what he was doing. Apparently he was a friend to the African-American community and probably not enough to get to make him mayor, but still I'm sure it did him some good. There's Mr. Riley with some of his constituents in the 1955 bid for mayor. Now the entertainers. This is the fun part to me because I remember a lot of this. These, this is Jimmy Mamou and his wife, Judy. As you can see, they are performers and this was clearly during the Batman craze. Jimmy Mamou and his wife, Judy, uh, were entertainers in North Beach at the Condor Club for many, many years. If you look at this uh, uh, marquee in the back, you will see, see that Carol was Carol Dota who, and who ultimately ended up taking this whole marquee. But I see there, there's Wally Cox, an old actor from the 40s, 50s, and 60s, who was also a stand-up comedian, and the Imperials, which was like Little Anthony and the Imperials back in those days. Now, the thing about Jimmy Mamou and Judy was that they were personal friends friends of the family. Jimmy's mother and family, which included three of his younger sisters who were my age, lived directly across the street from my family on McKinnon Avenue in San Francisco. And so he was more than just an entertainer that I met. He was just, he was a friend. He actually taught me how to play Pequino and poker when I was a kid. And when I won the money and came home with it, my mother made me take it over there and give it back. I was so disappointed. If I'd been smart, I would have kept it. This picture, as beautiful as it is, is one of the biggest regrets of my life because I was there that night. And this is Mary Wilson from The Supremes, my all-time favorite singer, Dionne Warwick. And here in the middle, that's Miss Lena Horn. Uh, this was at the Circle Star Theater in San Carlos in 1973. I remember it well because it was one of my father's gigs for photography, and he took me with him because I loved Dionne Warwick so much. I had all of her albums. I knew all of her lyrics. I was a Bacharach, uh, Burt Bacharach and Hal David fan, and this was um, my graduation present from my father. This woman here is Dee Dee Warwick. That's Dion's sister, and these two ladies here on the right were were her um, backup singers. When they got together to take this photograph, they kept beckoning me to come in. But I was 18 years old. I was so intimidated because I knew I was going to see Dionne Warwick and the Spinners at the Circle Star that night. But I had no idea Lena Horne was going to be there. Billy Eckstein was also there. I mean, it was a night to remember. This, as you can see, you might re recognize this character here. This is Cecil Williams from Glide Memorial Church. And he was always a fixture at a lot of events around San Francisco. He knew everybody and was part of everything. This gentleman in the middle is Lena Horne's son. I don't remember his name, but this was also the same night in 1973 at the Circle Star Theater. Now that's me and Dionne Warwick. I was very excited about meeting her. And you know, I look at this picture and I see me and Dionne Warwick, but I look at that, I used to think I was fat back then. I wasn't fat back then. I would take that right now. <laughs> that's me and one of the spinners. His name is Purvis Jackson. Oh, you know what I want to tell you about this was that when I was at this event and my father would introduce me to these people because he knew a lot of them. He said, that's my daughter. She just graduated from high school. I mean, these people stopped and came over to me and each one, I mean, even Lena Horn, they congratulated me on being a high school graduate. I mean, you would have thought I'd had a PhD or something, but education was very important to them. And it was so encouraging that they took a moment to give me some, praise me for at least getting out of high school. Now, 
this is Mr. Red Fox and Mr. Elmo Allison, um, clearly in the 1960s. Um, my father was acquainted, fairly acquainted with Red Fox. And whenever he was in town, my father always went to the gigs. And this was later on after so many years. And I don't even know where this is, but this is clearly in someone's home. Um, this is Mr. Slappy White. And this is Red Fox. They used to be a comedy team called Red and White back in the day. And if you watch old um, episodes of Sanford and Son, you will see Slappy White in some of the episodes because Red kept a lot of his comedian friends working. And an interesting point is that if you ever were a Sanford and Son fan, Sanford was actually Red Fox's last name. And so he put that in his show. So he actually was answering to himself. Now, that's me, self-portrait, 21st century. I thank you so much for allowing me to give you this presentation. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Anissa? Oh my gosh, thank you, Linda. That was so amazing. I oh, thank knew you. we were in for a treat. I'm gonna start <laughs> sharing your screen or let's see. I'm gonna steal the screen share. And put this up. That was amazing. And we do have a couple questions. And one person wanted to ask about uh, segregation at this time. Segregation in San Francisco? Yes. Oh, yes, it definitely did exist. And it's really interesting you should ask that question because when I was reading a lot of background stuff uh, on Mr. Orville Luster, who used to work with people about issues of racism and, and injustice uh, as being an activist, um, there was a woman who, who commented that in the South, you know where you stand because they have up these signs that say, you know, go to the back or no colored or whatever. But here on the West Coast, they just do it with the pencil, meaning that they change laws. They don't consult you. They don't, they are not hostile to you. Well, you, they did run into some hostility, but by and large, people um, just did things by laws. They would redline and rezone and do all of those sorts of things. And so they, and so yes, they did experience racism. I experienced racism right here in San Francisco as a little kid going to St. Teresa's in Petrero Hill. You know, not even a story worth mentioning now, but um, I don't want to um, present this as if there was some sort of fallacy that racism did not exist in San Francisco. Well, we clearly know that racism exists everywhere in America and unfortunately on the planet. But it was um, in many ways not as strident and, and aggressive because you have to understand a lot of these people who came from the South, my mother included, they'd seen lynchings. They'd seen people burned and, and, and beaten, or they had family members who had to run and leave town in the middle of the night because white people were out to kill them for some you know, innocuous offense. And so, uh, yes, there was racism everywhere, but here they were allowed to, I guess, move about a little differently and organize because a lot of these people were activists as well. They went home, they marched, they did all sorts of things. Any other questions? We do have one person recognizes perhaps somebody, Miss Gilmore of uh, Gilmore's Restaurant. Is that who that was? Well, I knew Mr. Gilmore. Oh, my goodness. You, uh, I hope they are able to point out who that was. Which one? Well, we'll have to get their information so that I can get that. That's well, wonderful. I was hoping on, that wait, someone would read, see let someone. Let me read the exact question. Was Mr. Gilmore, who is in one of the photos, the owner of Gilmore's Restaurant? restaurant i that don't remember on Street. you know what i think so i think so but i don't remember my father had so many friends and many of them were entrepreneurs and did so many things i don't remember the gilmore's having a restaurant per se but i was a kid you know i mean i really didn't pay attention to all of their businesses and mm -hmm. so um that may very well be so. I will try and uh, do a little research and see what I can't find out about that. But thank you for the clue. You can always steal the screen back too, Linda, if you wanted to pull up a photo. 
oh uh, no i'm good if someone okay. wants it i'll do it but somebody was um asking which is kind of in line with that next one is what kind of jobs were available it sounds like entrepreneurship was pretty big back then Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Well, you know, um, as I said, my aunt had her own dry cleaners, but my mother, you know, there was a time in San Francisco when it was a huge apparel city, meaning that there were a lot of apparel companies that had factories here in San Francisco. Most of them um, near First and Mission, where the old um, Transbay Terminal used to be. Um, where the, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm reading one of the questions that popped up, where the old Transbay Terminal used to be. My mother did piecework for one of those apparel companies. My mother was an incredible seamstress and later on um, started, you know, worked as, a, as an entrepreneur herself doing uh, seamstress work for her entire usher board, doing wedding dresses, bridesmaids dresses, all sorts of things. But yes, there were those types of jobs. Some, and there actually was discrimination within some of the hotels and it took a lot of um, uh, political uh, movement to get African Americans working in the hotels in, in various capacities besides just uh, housekeeping and, and that sort of thing. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I loved your um, story too about the labor, labor never cross a labor strike. So oh, much, yeah, yeah. Oh, to, even to this day. Um, Any other questions? There are several other questions. One of the best history book of the 20th century is, a, is Warmth of Other Suns by Isabel Wilkerson. The great migration told through the eyes of three individuals. One constant is staying in the family and community groups when they moved north and west. So your family would have stayed connected with friends from Texas and roots. I suppose that's a common question. Common oh question. my goodness. Thank you. That's a wonderful question. And thank you for giving me an opportunity to share this with you. Um, I know I, I can speak for my family, but I know that there were many other families who'd left the South, but our family, we used to go back every single year. There were very few years when I was growing up that we did not go to Houston to visit our relatives. My father it was very important to him that we know our family and where we had come from and how different our life was. And so every single year, we would jump in the Ford and we would drive across country. And because my father was a photographer, we all had cameras. I still own my original Brownie camera to this day. But we would take different routes from San Francisco to Texas. And so sometimes we'd go to the Great Salt Lake, the Grand Canyon, Las Vegas. We just went everywhere. But my father loved driving Route 66. That is the highway of my childhood because we used it so much going to Texas. And, you know, when you get out there, I don't know what it's like now because I haven't done a cross country road trip in many, many years. But back then, once you got so far out, you had no radio signals whatsoever. I mean, you might be able to get a country and Western station, but uh, we weren't into that. Um, but we also, I wanted to point out, we used a green book. There was a film that came out about a year or so ago called The Green Book. And I was so surprised that no one knew about this book because we never left home without it. The Green Book was um, prepared, put together by a man whose last name was Green. And he had been a US postal worker. And what he understood was that when African-Americans, you see what you have, when you have these new Negroes, they're getting new cars and they're driving and they're going back home, but they're still not safe. And so the Green Book was a book that could tell you every state in the union where you could where you could go and get food, get lodging, have a nice rest stop without molestation or running into the Klan. And so I remember so often we're riding in the car in the middle of, you know, the country, nothing around, and my father would be saying to my mother, what does the book say? What does the book say? And we would follow that. I don't know if we ever stayed in any of those facilities because I don't remember... Um, you know, anything negative happening when we were taking those trips. But one funny thing is that whenever um, he would, my father would stop the car and he'd say, you know, everybody get out and go to the bathroom. And we would say, oh, we don't have to go to the bathroom. He'd say, well, go do something. Because he knew what was coming. We might not have another convenient stop to use the bathroom. And so, um, you know, that was a big part of um, 
of our childhood. But getting back to Route 66, my father, who was not a very good singer, sang that Nat King Cole song just about all the way. It was the only song he sang when we were riding along. And I guess he did that to break up the the monotony of us kids in the back in the back seat singing every song we ever knew. You know. <laughs> I don't wish that on anybody. <laughs> Thanks for that question. Okay, Any other okay, questions? There are. So I'm going to try and combine a couple questions that are, are out here. Okay. Um, the first are, um, have you been to the Smithsonian exhibits and are any of these photos that you show today at the exhibit there? And you know, I'm going to tie it in with another question, Linda, which is, Sort of like the archive of the question, what are you what are you doing with these photos? What will happen to these photos? There are very people are very um, they're amazed and that they're important and they'd like to know what your plans are. Well, you know, I have all sorts of designs for these photographs, but I do have to tell you, this is my father's work. I am a writer, <laughs> so I'm trying to get my books published, you know, but this, you know, is like, uh, um, you know, close to my heart because my father never lived to see his work, you know, actually, you know, take off in the way that it has. Um, I hope at some point to be able, I mean, coronavirus changed everything, but there was a time, and we can probably do it in the way that we're doing this, I would like to take this information out to the schools. I mean, I have enough material so that I can do presentations for Black Music Month, which is in June, Black History Month, which now runs from January 15th to the end of February, you know, because it is important. History is important. I mean, and I when I hear people say, oh, I don't like history, I just, that's like saying you don't like chocolate or french fries or something like that how can you not like history history tells us who we are history tells us where we are going i wish agent orange knew a little bit more about history are there any other questions there are there are we so we still have a few more minutes and these are some some of them are pretty big questions but let me take on um one that's what uh oh uh, let's see here um what do you think people would say of Black Lives Matter now and sort of um, tying in another question, which was um, gentrif the gentrification of the African American community here in San Francisco. What do you think of all that? And what do okay. you think, think the folks in the photo would think of this situation? The first part, uh, what they would think they would be happy and they would be amazed. What I'd like to share with you is that I think it was the summer of 1963. See, when my when we would go to uh, Houston. Uh-oh, you're freezing a little bit, Linda. To visit. Sometimes it was during the summer when my parents just took regular vacation photography and we would just take our, our schoolwork on the road. Uh-oh, it says my internet connection. Are you, I'm getting a signal that my internet connection. Am I okay? Okay, great, great, great. Uh, okay, um, read that question again. I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought with that okay. sign. I thought um, I was losing gentr people. Gentrification. No, the other part, in the first part. Um, I, I deleted it or moved it to the next Oh, thing, that's okay. okay. Oh, what they would think, what they would think. Yes. I'm back. I'm back. 1963. We're on the road and we're in our station wagon on the road and there are buses and cars and people are blowing their horns and waving. This is out in the middle of the country because everybody's on their way to the March on Washington. Okay. So just for days and days, I mean, it was just this phenomenal thing. And I remember my father saying, yeah, they're going to change things. It's going to be happening now. They were very, very excited about it. You know, my mother was, my mother didn't talk a lot about it, th the things that she experienced growing up in the South, but my father talked about everything. And he would have been so proud and happy. He would have been out there like John Lewis, standing on Black Lives Matter Plaza, um, uh, you know, um, showing, you know, his support for the young people um, doing all of this. Okay. Any other there, there, there are lots of other questions and comments. We are at our time, but I'm, I'm willing to go through this if you are, Linda. Continue. Well, I mean, it's three o'clock. Can we do like till three fifteen? Is that okay? We definitely can. So okay. Let's, um, um, let's see. 
people want you to have an exhibit of these photos. So there's that. People are very like, they, they're, they like me when I saw um, Linda mention in the beginning, thanking my son. I made my son do all the scanning of the photos for Linda. <laughs> so I saw all these photos and they are, I can, I can relate with people feeling like, oh my gosh, I want to see more of these. So there's people asking, can you have an exhibit? Um, they're wondering if you, if your father took any pictures of Miss Ardath Nicholas, a community organizer, Bayview Region, San Francisco. Do you know what? What you see here and what I extracted in order to do this presentation today is just a mere thumbnail of the photographs that I have. And more importantly, I still have the majority of the negatives to all of these photographs. Wow. Okay, now they're over 50 years old, so they are not, some of them are not in pristine condition, but some of them are. Um, as for that individual, I have a lot of photographs of people that I cannot identify. And one of the great things, if I could get an exhibit going, would be to be able to have people come in and identify their relatives, because I know that there are still a few San Franciscans around here who know people. People, you know, so uh, from your lips to God's ears, if anybody wants to host a, uh, an exhibit, I'm down with it. Well, you keep in touch with me, Linda. If we ever reopen again, I, I might know a place where we can have an exhibit. <laughs> okay, okay, I'd like that. <laughs> um, does it make you, uh, let's see. Um, this is interesting. Were your father's photos published in local media at the time? Yes. Good question, because it lets me tell, share something else about that. My father's work was uh, in local media. He was also in Jet and Ebony Magazine, which are two major African-American publications. But one of the things, my father knew a lot of people. He came across a lot of people in, in his work. And he used to tell us about his friend who was doing this research on his family, um, going to um, all different parts of the world, going to the South. He's telling us about his friend, Alex Haley. My father told us about Alex Haley preparing roots when I was a little girl and I had no real concept of what that was about. And then the book came out and then the television show came out and it just all came together. I found you, you old African. You know, that was just, it was just amazing. So, um, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. You must have some amazing stories. I can't wait for that memoir. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I have a nice one. Linda, uh, I'm a Chinese American, fourth generation. It seems, oops, it's jumpy. It seems, I lost it. Ooh, ooh, oh, there we go. It seems my extended family from my mother and father did not communicate to use the history of anti Chinese discrimination they have faced. How was it in your family? About about my parents talking about discrimination? Yes. My father talked about it all the time. My mother talked about it very little. Now, the only thing that made my mother mad, my mother hated Elvis Presley. And I understand now that because she was thinking in terms of cultural misappropriation, because she said she knew boys in her neighborhood when she was growing up that could do the same thing far better with a guitar on Saturday night on the front porch than what Elvis Presley did on the uh, Ed Sullivan show. So she had a thing about Elvis Presley. But I do want to sh um, share something about my father and our family connection to the Chinese community in San Francisco. My father worked for the federal government. And he had a very dear friend named Mr. Chang, who was from China. And my father used to help Mr. Chang. And, and, well, they were friends. And so they supported each other. And Mr. Chang would have relatives that would come over. And my father and Mr. Chang would help them get jobs with the government. And whenever we would go to Chinatown, we would go to Mr. Chang. He had uh, family members that owned restaurants and whatever. So I grew up on Chinese food. I mean, this is the most incredible Chinese food um, in my life as a child, going to these wonderful restaurants in Chinatown. And because they respected my father so much, his money was no good. We, I mean, they, and they'd give him just big bottles of liquor and all the food, and then they'd give us food to take home. But one of the things that they did was for the children, they gave my, us um, red silk Chinese pajamas and the little silk slippers. And 
um, when I think back on that, it was one of the nicest times in my life because they were so kind to us. And we always had such a good time in Chinatown. And there was someone in the family that used to take the little cardboard rolls off of the uh, toilet paper when it when the toilet paper was gone you've got this little cardboard roll left they would stuff it with candy and all sorts of goodies and then wrap it in bright paper brightly colored you know gift wrap paper tie um, the ends with pretty ribbon and they would give them to us along with red envelopes with money and and, um, and you know it was just really wonderful but one thing that I saw that I don't think that many people have seen in this uh, in, in, in my generation I saw women from China who had their feet bound. When I was a little girl, there were still women that were over here that had their feet bound. And of course, they walked a, diff a, a particular way because of the feet binding. Now, my sister and I, we didn't know that, you know, that, you know, what all of that meant, but we liked the walk and we would put on our red silk pajamas as children do. And we were, you know, trying to imitate these women because we thought that they were lovely. We thought that they were beautiful. But I didn't understand about the feet binding until I started studying history. My background in history is not only African-American history, but Asian history as well, um, which was, I guess, a no-brainer for me, you know, um, having been born and raised in San Francisco. So um, I guess I've answered your question, but yes, my father talked about racism and his experiences a lot. My mother didn't talk about it at all, except for Elvis. <laughs> Interesting. Um, a, a few questions kind of tie together about redevelopment in the Fillmore and what it did to the businesses, what it did to the community, and how it, you know, it kind of cut the African American community. Um, you want to talk on that a bit? Well, you know, um... The ravages of redevelopment turn up in, in many of my short stories because I remember the Fillmore when I was growing up. I mean, it had smells and sounds. There were, you know, meat markets and billiard halls and cafes and, and beauty parlors and candy stores. I mean, it was thriving and there were all sorts of languages. You just heard everything, but the flavor was black. And because it was so culturally diverse, I am so proud to say that I believe that I can understand English. I don't care what kind of accent you put on it because I grew up in this city and I just, I mean, it was just such a wonderful experience to be here. I wouldn't change growing up in San Francisco to grow up any place else in the world, not even Paris. And I love Paris. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. I think that is a good place to conclude. Some of the, the questions and the chat will be uh, preserved in the recording. The recording is not available to the public, but Linda, you can get all of these questions for yourself if there's some you'd like to answer. And there is, um, there's talk of online exhibitions is a thing. We can, we can talk like that offline if you want to ever work on something like that. And they would love to have your contact information if that's okay, maybe an email we can Send that out if you want to later, or you can give it to them now. I will give you an email um, later on, Anissa, and you can send it out to anyone who participated today or anyone who requested, you know, if they, you know, want to talk about the photographs or, or writing or any of those things, I'd be happy to uh, hear from them. That's great. And Jen, thank you for that link to the um, Pittsburgh archive. That sounds awesome. T Teeny Harris archive. So oh, Teeny Harris. Yes, yes, yes. Photographer, yes. yes. So we should check that out and see what our options are, Linda. <laughs> Will do. Because and I want to thank everyone so, so much. Amazing photos. And we thank you today, Linda. We thank all of our participants out there. And this is where the, um, you know, weirdness of virtual world gets weird. We just say thank you and ends the meeting. So thank you, everyone, for coming. We see you, but we feel you. Linda, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate it so much. It's been a blast. I hope I get an opportunity to meet with you again. That was wonderful. Okay. All right, everyone, enjoy the rest of their Sunday, and thank you for being with us today. Signing off.